In the criminal underworld, violence and murder are at the crux of power wielded by organized crime. These criminal organizations have multiple members who are willing and able to commit murder whenever it is deemed necessary. However, there are some men who become so skilled at the job of murder that their crimes become legendary. These killers are calculating, prolific, efficient, and know how to send a message. These killers are organized crime's top hitmen. Number 14. Thomas. Tommy Karate. Patera. Thomas Patera was born on December 2, 1954, in the Brooklyn borough of New York City. His father was Joseph Joe Patera, an Italian-American who immigrated from Campania in the province of Salerno, Italy. His mother, Catherine Bogowski, was of German and Polish descent. The couple raised young Thomas and older sister Teresa in the Gravesend neighborhood of Brooklyn, where his father was an independent wholesale candy salesman who sold numerous brands of candy, including Mary Jane, Pixie Sticks, Red Hots, Lemon Drops, and Bazooka Chewing Gum. Patera attended David A. Booty Jr. High School. In school, young Tommy would be picked on and ostracized by fellow students due to his high-pitched, nearly falsetto voice and frail build. In Gravesend, there were a lot of bullies, and to them, Tommy looked like fresh meat. Not wanting to appear weak, Tommy oftentimes would not inform his parents of the bullying. The bullying, however, did reinforce an antisocial mindset Tommy would carry on throughout his entire life. Growing up, Tommy liked baseball. However, he did not try out for the team at Booty due to the hazing of other students. In an act that would foreshadow his future, he would later break into Booty Junior High and steal the school baseball team's equipment as an act of revenge. He would sell it to fences in the neighborhood in what would give him his first taste of the criminal lifestyle. Tired of being the victim of constant bullying, Patera began to gravitate towards martial arts. At the age of 12, Patera had become a huge fan of the 1966 television show, The Green Hornet, starring actors Bruce Lee and Van Williams. He idolized these men and their fighting prowess on screen, and it wasn't long before he asked his parents to enroll him in karate classes. After persuading his parents, he joined a karate school in Sheepshead Bay, Brooklyn, and quickly became one of the class's best students. He also changed his diet and appearance, dining on Asian cuisine, such as sushi, and growing his hair past his shoulders to emulate his idol, Bruce Lee. By the time Tommy entered high school, his skinny frame had filled out with sinewy muscle, and as he progressed in his training, he began to enter tournaments, winning several. Growing up in Gravesend, an area steeped in mafia influence, Tommy also found other idols. He began to look up to the gangsters in the area with their flashy clothes and fancy cars. More importantly, he was in awe of the fear and respect that they commanded. Eventually, along with the accolades in martial arts came cash prizes and a ticket to live in Japan and learn martial arts from the local masters there. When Tommy arrived in Japan, he fell in love with the country. He especially enjoyed the kindness and respect people in Japan showed him and each other. Once there, Patera studied under Sensei Hiroshi Masumi in the ways of Ko Ryu Ninjutsu. He would embrace the way of the samurai, still prevalent in Japanese martial arts culture. In Japan, he would also further develop physically. He still had his high-pitched voice, but here, no one belittled him. Here, he was thought of as a fighter and a champion. He ended up staying in Japan for 27 months. When Patera returned to New York in 1976, he not only had the skills to handle himself, but also had a newfound confidence that he lacked on the streets growing up. After returning to Brooklyn, Patera began hanging around the bars and social clubs in Gravesend and soon became close to Bonanno family mobster Anthony Bruno Indelicato, the son of Sonny Red Indelicato, a powerful capo in the Bonanno crime family. Anthony Bruno Indelicato was known as a stone-cold killer with a bad cocaine habit. Patera became an associate in the Bonanno crime family and through the Indelicados became well known in underworld circles. 
Using his martial arts experience and an innate fighting ability, Patera was just the kind of muscle the Bananos were looking for. It wouldn't be long before he would be asked to put in work for the family. It is alleged that he committed his first murder in 1978. According to Thomas Patera's biography, The Butcher, by Philip Carlo, he was given a name, an address, and a photo. Without reservation, he killed the man on a residential Brooklyn street. In completing the contract, he showed his superiors that they could count on him when it came to the act of murder. Besides being a skilled martial artist, Patera had become an expert on how one can hurt, kill, and dispose of the human body. He studied a number of books on torture, interrogation, and anything he thought was important for a killer to know. Things would change quickly for Patera when on July 12, 1979, Bonanno acting boss Carmine Galante was murdered. Involved in the hit was Patera's close friend, Anthony Bruno and Delicato. After Galante's death, there were two factions attempting to seize power. On one side, there was Philip Rusty Ristelli, the currently imprisoned and commission-approved acting boss. On the other was Bruno's father, the powerful capo, Alphonse Sonny Red and Delicato. This set in motion a chain of events leading to the infamous Three Capos murder in which Alphonse Sonny Red and Delicato would be murdered along with two other captains. Sonny Red's murder put his son Bruno and by proxy Tommy Patera in serious peril. Bruno and Patera barricaded themselves in a house on the outskirts of Long Island. Patera was loyal and dedicated to Bruno and at that time was willing to fight and die with him. Word was finally sent down that if Bruno would let go of what happened to his father, he could resume his place within the Borgata. An agreement was reached and Anthony Bruno and Delicato forswore vengeance for the death of his father and thus was spared the same fate. Bruno and Delicato had lost a lot of clout. However, that did not stop the rise of his young associate, Tommy Patera. Tommy Karate, as he was now known because of his martial arts background, would be taken under the wing of Anthony Spiro and Frank Lino and become one of their most relied upon hitmen and loan collectors. As Patera's reputation continued to rise within the family, other Bonanno heavyweights such as new underboss, Joseph Big Joe Messina, and boss, Philip Rusty Restelli, knew when they handed Patera a contract, he would take care of it immediately and exactly as ordered. Because of this, Patera would officially become a made man in the family. The ceremony was held in a two-story red brick house in Bensonhurst, Brooklyn, just off of Bath Avenue. The Bonanno administration, which now included Spiro as the consigliere, decided Patera would be placed in the crew of Frank Lino, a no-nonsense mafioso steeped in the traditions of Cosa Nostra. Under Lino, Patera would become one of the most feared hitmen in all of the New York underworld. Despite the mafia's ban on drug dealing, most families still had men that dealt drugs off the books. The Bonanno family, however, was much more blatant in ignoring the ban since the days of Carmine Galante. Patera became a major drug dealer in his own right, and those that didn't pay with money ended up paying with their lives. Thomas Salerno would find out the hard way. Tommy Karate Patera would murder Salerno and leave his corpse in a car next to the Gravesend Cemetery, which Patera would later joke about with other mobsters. The body count continued to rise when Patera murdered Talal Siksik. Siksik was a drug dealer for Patera and was thought to be a police informant. Siksik would be abducted by two of Patera's men and was then beaten and tortured before Patera arrived with Bonanno associate Frank Ganji and put two in his head. Ganji, despite knowing Patera well, was shocked at the quick, nonchalant manner in which Patera executed Siksik. With the help of Frank Ganji and his other two men, Billy Bright and Shlomo Mendelssohn, Siksik was dismembered with a hacksaw. Patera's approach to murder and body disposal was both cold-hearted and clinical. Tommy Karate again showed why he was one of the top hitters in New York. Sick Sick was dumped in pieces at the William T. Davis Wildlife Refuge. Patera would often use the William T. Davis Wildlife Refuge because he believed the damp soil would accelerate decomposition 
and the wildlife refuge would ensure bodies were not discovered during construction projects. Patera studied books on dissection and carried a special toolkit for cutting up bodies. He always insisted on burying corpses deep enough so that police dogs could not locate their scent. Before burying body parts, he either wrapped them in plastic or placed them in suitcases in order to make discovery less likely. Patera's weakness was that he enjoyed keeping jewelry and other souvenirs of his work. This quirk caused many to speculate that Tommy Karate had serial killer tendencies. On October 6, 1987, Merrick Kucharski would learn the hard way not to mess with Patera or his crew. When an argument over stolen rugs became physical, Frank Ganji and Tommy Patera would stab and eventually cut the throat of Kucharski. Just another dismembered body added to Patera's private cemetery at the William T. Davis Wildlife Refuge. The chip on Patera's shoulder from being picked on as a youth was now resurfacing as violent cruelty. It didn't matter if it was a man or a woman. This became apparent when the love of his life, a woman by the name of Celeste Lepari, died from a drug overdose. Lepari was beautiful, but she was also a junkie. She would go out clubbing and use cocaine and heroin to have a good time. She was usually accompanied by her good friend Phyllis Birdie, who was another pretty neighborhood girl who had gotten addicted to the product, peddled by many of the area's mobsters. Though both women had chosen their lifestyles, Patera believed Birdie was a bad influence on Lapari. So when Lapari overdosed and died, Patera blamed Birdie. Patera knew that Birdie was close to a member of his crew named Frank Ganji. Knowing that, Patera had ordered Ganji to inform him the next time he saw Phyllis Birdie. It is rumored that Ganji did not want to inform Patera on Birdie, however Ganji would be backed into a corner when they were seen by one of Patera's drug dealers leaving a club together. Later on, Patera would get Ganji on the phone. Too afraid to lie after being seen together with Birdie, Ganji told Patera that she was currently at his location. Ganji would then give Patera the address, and Patera would head straight over. When he arrived, he walked into the bedroom where Birdie was sleeping and shot her three times. He then moved her body into the bathroom and began dismembering her in the jacuzzi. He placed her severed head on the edge of the tub, creating an image that would haunt Ganji for the rest of his life. Meanwhile, in the world of Cosa Nostra, Patera's reputation was on the rise. He became such a sought-after hitman that the Bananos would lend him out to other families when they needed a special piece of work done. An example of this occurred when his Bonanno superiors sent him to kill former Gambino associate and undercover informant Wilfred Willie Boy Johnson as a favor to Gambino boss John Gotti. On August 29, 1988, Patera, along with Vincent Kojak Gaetano, allegedly ambushed Johnson as he walked from his home to his car and shot him to death. The gunman fired 19 rounds and Johnson was hit once in each thigh, twice in the back, and at least six times in the head. No one was safe around Tommy Patera, not even the people working for him. Joseph Balzano was one of Patera's dealers who smoked about as much product as he sold. There were rumors that Balzano had been talking openly about murders and dismembered bodies buried in the wildlife refuge. To top it off, Balzano owed Patera a lot of money for drugs that were fronted to him and were used rather than sold. Balzano, who was already considered weak because of his freebase cocaine addiction, was killed for these reasons. Patera and Ganji pretended they were taking him out to dinner to discuss various problems. Instead, Ganji stabbed Balzano with an ice pick whereupon Patera shot him in the back of the head and slit his throat. Balzano's body was dumped in an alley near a gas station. Patera thought of himself as a man of respect, and because of that, any disrespect was not tolerated. Andrew Jakakis, who was a close friend of Frank Ganji's, made the fatal mistake of disrespecting Tommy Patera during an argument after Ganji had allegedly shot himself in the leg. Patera was incensed by Jakakis' behavior enough so that Patera had planned to torture and kill Andrew Jakakis. Ganji, who did not want to see his friend Andy Jakakis tortured to death by Tommy Karate, 
decided to kill him first and give him a quick, clean, and relatively painless death. Ganji and another crew member picked Jakakis up for a meeting. While driving, Jakakis would be shot in the back of the head. His body was left in a vacant lot in Brooklyn. This murder, like the murder of Phyllis Birdie, distressed Frank Ganji greatly. Ganji's remorse for his actions were still overridden by his fear of Tommy Patera, and thus, Ganji continued to operate as one of Patera's top crew members. Frank Rubino would be the next to die. After a falling out with Gambino capo Eddie Lino, Rubino essentially signed his own death warrant. Lino would ask Patera to help him take care of the troublesome Frank Rubino, and for Patera, being asked by a real gangster like Lino to join him on a hit was an honor. Patera and Lino would corner Rubino, and soon after, Patera would pull the trigger, killing him. Meanwhile, law enforcement was tightening the noose around Tommy Patera, and it would get a lot tighter after the arrest of Shlomo Mendelssohn. After Mendelssohn's arrest on a drug pinch, he made a deal with investigators and the DA to enter the Witness Protection Program in exchange for witness testimony on the Talel Siksik murder. Another wise guy named Joe Dish Senatore was convinced to wear a wire and record conversations with Patera. While Joe Dish could not get Patera to incriminate himself, he was able to get a number of others around Patera on tape talking about the crimes they committed. This would be huge for lead investigator Jim Hunt and his team. Meanwhile, Patera continued to operate with impunity and new opportunities continued to come his way. One such opportunity came when a large-scale marijuana dealer by the name of Michael Harrigan came to Patera through one of his associates by the name of Manny Maya. After the introduction, Harrigan complained that he had been working under John Gotti Jr. and that their relationship was untenable. Gotti Jr. and his in-your-face attitude had soured Harrigan on their partnership. In short, Harrigan wanted to leave Gotti Jr. and come under Patera's wing. Patera and Harrigan then became partners and informed Gotti Jr. Patera wasn't worried about a beef because he knew that Gotti Jr. could not ask for help from his father, being that there was a ban on drugs, and as such, Gotti Jr.'s operation was off the record. For Gotti Jr.'s part, he knew how dangerous Patera was and that there would be no muscling Tommy Karate. A sit-down between the two made men occurred. At the sit-down, Patera told Gotti Jr. that Harrington was now on record with him, and that if he had a problem, he could take it up with his father, who at the time was the sitting boss of the Gambino family. Gotti Jr. knew he could not tell his father, because the beef involved drugs, and thus, the operation was taken over by Patera, and both he and Harrigan remained partners. A small problem would arise after the fact when another of Gotti and Harrington's former partners in the marijuana business... Greg Ryder approached Harrigan. Ryder was upset that Harrigan had essentially taken their business out from under he and Gotti. In response to this, Harrigan told Patera about the argument. Harrigan, assuming that Patera was just going to straighten his old friend Greg Ryder out, called for the meeting as instructed by Patera. At the meeting, Patera took a different course of action, however, shooting Greg Ryder with a shotgun and killing him. Ryder became just another addition to the body count. On March 15, 1989, Patera heard a rumor that two men in his crew were giving information to law enforcement on his activities. Patera, after learning the names of the suspected informants, would ambush them in one of the nightclubs he owned. Richie Leone and Saul Stern would walk into the club, but they would never walk out. The two were sadistically tortured by Patera, suffering greatly before their deaths. When Billy Bright told Ganji about the murders, Ganji was grateful Patera hadn't asked him to take part. Frank Ganji's doubts about life in the mob were coming to a head when he was pulled over and arrested for DUI on April 10, 1990. While in jail, he started talking to a detective he knew from a prior arrest. In the aftermath of that conversation, he would become an informant and would begin giving information on Thomas Patera. By 1990, Tommy Karate Patera was one of the most feared wise guys in the Mafia. Little did he know that with Ganji's help, the law was closing in on him. Finally, on June 4, 1990, 
Thomas Patera was indicted for heading a drug dealing crew and for his involvement in seven murders, including the 1988 Wilfred Willie Boy Johnson murder. Investigators alleged that Patera had been involved in as many as 60 murders, and on June 25, 1992, he would be convicted on six of those killings. He was also convicted of supervising a massive drug dealing operation in Brooklyn. However, Patera was acquitted in the 1988 Willie Boy Johnson murder. During the sentencing deliberations, the jury rejected the death penalty for Patera. In October 1992, alluding to evidence that Patera brutally killed his victims and dismembered their bodies, Judge Rena Raji sentenced him to life in prison. As she passed sentence, Judge Raji would address Patera directly, saying, Mr. Patera, nobody deserves to die as these people did. As of April 2017, Patera is serving a life sentence at the United States Penitentiary McCreary near Pine Knot, Kentucky. Tommy Karate Patera was one of the most brutal and fearsome hitmen in the history of the Mafia. Jim Hunt, assistant special agent in charge of the New York DEA, stated, Tommy was a psychopath, an animal. He'd walk into a social club and the guys would all turn to face him. No one wanted their back to Tommy Patera. Chief Prosecutor David W. Shapiro said in court documents that he murdered almost everyone himself, taking delight in being the executioner and then the butcher of the victim's bodies. Perhaps author Philip Carlo, who wrote a book on Patera called The Butcher, Anatomy of a Mafia Psychopath, said it best when he stated to the New York Post, He was the baddest of the bad. He scared the scary guys. Without a doubt, Tommy Karate Patera was one of the most feared gangsters of his era and one of organized crime's top hitmen.